Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the day. Um, flood memories, crafting stories from Vermont floods. We have Taiga from Vault Line Ensemble. I'm Catherine from the Vermont Arts Council. Hello. So, welcome. How's volume now? Is that good? Great. Okay. I'm scared of microphones, but I'm working on getting over it. So thank you for being here for that process for me. Um, I'm Tyga. Um, I work with Vermont Emergency Management as a regional coordinator for the southern third of the state. And I'm also, I also co-direct a theater ensemble called Fault Line. Um, my background is in EMS, uh, more recently search and rescue and swift water rescue and before that in theater. And those, those two things and bringing those two things together has been um, what most of my adult life has been about, which is kind of, a strange, um, kind of a strange combination. I get a lot of questions of like, why are you doing these two things? How are these two things related? I think probably people in this room don't need to be told why these things are related. Um, but the, the through line that I see in them is because of these sets of questions. And, some of these are framed a bit more towards emergency managers and first responders because that's usually who I'm talking to about this work. So um, I'm excited to have a group of artists and arts organizations and people who are more on the other side of that spectrum to see, see how this um, sits with you. I think a lot of it will be more intuitive than to some of the folks I talk with about this. Um, I try to bring questions, especially to the emergency management, first response, health worker side, um, about how stories can help reach communities with information and with knowledge and with learning in ways that other kinds of teaching might not. Um, looking specifically at what lessons we can learn from narrative that we might not learn from lecture, that we might not learn from didactic learning, which is a lot of how health worker and emergency response education is still happening. Um, and thinking about Emergency and disaster in Vermont thinking specifically, what do we need to know in order to get through and survive and thrive um, climate change and the situations that we are in right now? And how can narrative and story and the arts um, help us in that, in that journey? Uh, I work, like I said, with a, a group called Fault Line Ensemble. We're 10 years old this year, um, informally 10 years old last year, but we're 10 years from having a name this year. Um, and we are a collective of artists and health workers. We're doing work that loosely, we hope, fosters community um, resilience and health. And that looks like a lot of different things. Um, often it is working around themes of health justice and healthcare access, but we also work with health workers um, who are trying to learn through immersive health education. So doing things like emergency drills and exercises using actors. Um, and putting people in highly realistic situations and um, letting people get their adrenaline moving and working with people who are having highly emotional reactions to an emergency um, and practicing what that experience is like. This is the first project we did. It was 10 years ago in Oregon. Um, these are photos from a play that we did about the 9.0 earthquake that is forecasted to hit the Pacific Northwest sometime in the next 50 years-ish. Um, so maybe within our lifetimes, maybe not. It's gonna be massive when it hits. Um, and it's a region that doesn't have a lot of lived experience of earthquakes because it tends to get a 9.0 earthquake every 300 years and not much in between. Um, and so we, we asked ourselves, how can we help this community, our community? A lot of us lived in Oregon at the time. Um, imagine what this disaster would look like if it hit and what it would take to get through it, and specifically what we could do to support each other as civilians, as neighbors, um, as part of, part of one specific community within the city. What would we need in order to support each other getting through this? And so we created a um, disaster shelter in a warehouse turned theater that we turned back into a warehouse. The theater did not love the way we displayed their space because they put a lot of effort into making it not feel like a warehouse. And then we made it feel like a warehouse again. Um, in order to uh, set up a makeshift earthquake shelter and put the audience in a space of being in a shelter one month out from this massive earthquake, surrounded by people who were telling stories about what had happened during the earthquake and since the earthquake, 
to them and their family and their community um, and finding ways to support one another through the things that they were facing. Um, and asking this question of how do we imagine something that is not imaginable to this community, um, that we do not have living memory of having survived. We also um, do a lot of thinking about occupational health in different fields. Um, in this case, this was an outdoor performance about the emotional impact of studying climate change and trying to use a window into the emotional experience of that, um, that field to learn about ways that we can, we can think about and imagine um, and prepare ourselves for climate change. So this performance was based on handwritten letters from climate scientists around the world that have been collected by a science communicator in Australia. And we created an adaptation of these handwritten letters that are all answering the question, how does climate change make you feel? And presented, presented adaptations of these letters to an audience um, and asked them, how does climate change make you feel? And how does that emotional experience give us a window into how we can move forward rather than looking at, at numbers um, and more, more concrete, concrete facts, um, the way that a lot of that climate change education tends to go. And then finally, the kind of other side of um, occupational health that we've worked on is working with EMTs and paramedics, um, which many of us are um, in many of the ensemble members um, work in EMS, including myself, at various points of my life, and working specifically around themes of mental health and vicarious trauma and exploring what it's like to talk about those things because um, a lot of EMS agencies have a culture that is very, uh, very tough and very, like, you bury the hard things and you don't, um, you don't go into detail and you don't go into talking about your emotions or talking about the hard calls with your coworkers. We, like, we compartmentalize and, um, and pack that stuff away and it doesn't show up until it shows up in, in some pretty, pretty rough ways sometimes. So this is a performance that we're touring to ambulance bays um, around the Northeast. This is, these are photos from a performance in Brattleboro, Vermont at Rescue Inc. in their ambulance bay. Um, asking, asking the question, how do we show people the importance and also the challenges of this work and how does talking about the challenges of it um, help us and also our communities understand its importance and understand what can be done to support people who are doing that work. Um, in the wake of the floods, I know a lot of people became first responders who might not think of themselves as first responders, and so I think this is relevant to a lot more people than, than just our, our target audience right now. So with all of these, we're starting with a narrative, and I'm gonna ask you all to join me um, in crafting a little bit of narrative today. Um, but we're starting with stories. This picture on the far left is one of our artists, um, Leaf, standing in uh, concentric rings of stories from EMTs and paramedics who have um, struggled with vicarious trauma in some way over the course of their career. So we'll start with stories of our, our own, our coworkers, our comrades. In this case, um, we partnered with an organization called the Code Green Campaign that's been gathering these first-hand narratives for, um, I think, almost a decade now. Um, we start with narrative. We bring in um, a collective of dramaturgs and writers and musicians. Um, and then we bring in performers and use theater of the oppressed and physical improvisation to create stories that are on their feet and living in a 3D world. And that's the, that's the summary of what's a like very, very long collective process of usually a couple of years per show for us. Um, but I'm gonna ask you to join me a little bit in this. And we're a small group, so that should make it easy um, to have conversation in this like very large space. I wanna think about the narratives that narratives that are not being told about Vermont, whether it's about flooding um, or other disaster or emergency situations that you all have been in, um, or about arts and arts organizations and what it takes to survive as an arts organization um, in, in this space and in this state. Um, I'm gonna show you one example from work that we've done and 
please be a little patient with me while I figure out the audio volume. It's not going to be super loud, I don't think. We just tested it, but it might be too quiet. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a quick, uh, quick example of a couple of minutes and then um, ask you to, to do some brainstorming. So like do the post-lunch last session of the day mental preparation to get ready to talk to someone else in the room if that is something that's comfortable for you. Um, this is a clip from the earthquake play that I showed you photos of before. Uh, it's, a, it's a monologue that is not based in an actual lived experience because the earthquake hasn't happened yet. The last one was 1700. And so we researched and made up a story that we thought was plausible and had a lesson in it or some, like, some pieces in it that we wanted to encourage people to imagine. And the context that I'll give before it is that there is not a lot of um, there's not a lot of knowledge about the magnitude of this earthquake and what it would mean when it hits that that region, just because there's there are so few earthquakes in between the big ones, and that Portland is a city that's bisected by a river and has the most bridges per capita of any major U.S. city, and those bridges hold like quite a lot of emotional. Um, emotional power and like fondness for a lot of a lot of people who live there and they're kind of a, a symbol of a symbol of the city for for a lot of people so give you that <laughs> the bridges in the city fascinated me when i first got here especially the older ones when they went up and the whole thing would rumble like it was alive you know i felt it come on slow at first, like a freight train coming through the whole city. And I just thought, oh shit, this is gonna be big. And then it was too hard to think or stay balanced or oriented because everything was moving. I mean, what were we supposed to hold on to? The sky? I could see the bridge. You know how it has the two tall parts with the weights and, and they lift the drawbridge part? Well, those counterweights started shuddering and then they were swinging around with the shaking back and forth and the whole bridge is swaying too and the support beams must have snapped because one tower came down at an angle and it fell towards the river and it sort of ripped the bridge apart sideways and that must have broken the other way loose because it dropped down and it hit the train tracks and it crashed into the water and then it was just ramps and supports crumbling onto the banks. <coughs> then it just wasn't a bridge at all anymore. I tried to call Maddie but my phone didn't work, so I tried to get across the river to find him, but all of the bridges were down, or they were suddenly closed off. And so I rode and I ran from bridge to bridge, but they wouldn't let me across. So I thought, well, fine, I'll just swim. But then I got down to the river, and it was so much wider and stronger than I remember. I mean, I looked at the river before. I'm not an idiot. But there's a difference between looking at a river from the bridge and, and looking at it from the shore. I just didn't know if I could do it. And then I thought, Maddie would have done it. So this is one, one piece of one personal narrative that is fictional. Um, but that one of our uh, collaborators came up with and there were a couple of pieces embedded in it that we thought it was important to encourage people to imagine um, who were living in this in this earthquake zone. One was the suddenness that this this will um, 
the sudden nature of this event, the like lack of warning. Um, one was just the magnitude of what a 9.0 earthquake would feel like or would likely feel like if you were in the, the Portland metro area or a lot of different parts of Oregon. Um, and the third big one that a lot of people don't have a lot of knowledge of is that of these bridges, there are, I think, two at this point, or at the time that this was that this performance happened, there was one bridge and one under construction that were projected to withstand a 9.0 earthquake, and that's of 12, um, and the rest were all expected to be too damaged to be passable. Um, and those two, for the first few days after an earthquake, would be limited to emergency vehicle traffic only. And so what we wanted people to think about and what was new to a lot of people was that if you were on the other side of the bridge from your house or your loved ones, it would be days before you could cross again if you were on um, the opposite side of the river and cell phone traffic would likely not be going through. And so thinking about using, using the narrative of someone experiencing that to get people thinking about what would I do if I work on one side of the river and live on the other or if my kids are in school on a different side of the river or if I just happened to be somewhere where I am not usually um, when something like this happened. <laughs> the bridges in the city <laughs> fascinated me. Sorry, Spacebar did something different than I thought. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to find um, a buddy in the room. <laughs> and, um, and before you do that, I wanna take just a minute and I have two prompts here and you can think about either. One of them is, what is a story from your work that shows something the public doesn't know about the kind of work that you do? Um, or something important that, that people should know about your work that you have insight into that other people might not. Um, and if you want to, want to be thinking about Vermont's flooding, what's the moment you remember most from the floods, either last year or this year? Irene, um, or from, from any kind of uh, emergency incident that you might have experienced. Um, and again, this is written for, originally for emergency managers. So it's very Vermont-centric, but if you have experience outside of Vermont, um, that's great as well. So take just a minute, think about these two questions, think about um, a story that comes to mind. And when you have one like put a hand up a little bit so that I can get a sense of where people are at timing wise. Yeah. And you don't need to pair off quite yet, but if it helps you to have a buddy to bounce ideas off of, go for it. Does anyone not have the beginning of a, the beginning of an idea? Anyone need more time? You're gonna have more time to talk to each other in a minute. But does anyone not have a place to start in your head? Okay, good. Okay, great. Um, so now before we start sharing them with each other, take just a minute and think about the most vivid pieces of that memory. Um, Specifically, I want to ask, what did you see? What were you thinking? What were you feeling in that moment? What was the sensory experience like? Um, and what do you remember most from the sensory experience of that moment? So again, take, take a minute. Um, if you have a notebook or a phone and want to note anything down, feel free, but no pressure. Um, and as you think about those moments, what did you learn from this experience that you might want an audience you're sharing it with to remember or to take away?
think. Just hold it in your mind for now. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to call you back for just a minute. You'll have more time. <laughs> You'll have more time to talk to each other. I love that people are talking to each other. Sometimes with first responders, people are like, I'm thinking, but I'm not going to say anything because it's too intimidating. So thank you for being excited about that. Yeah, no, this is great. I was like, I think this is going to go a little different than this usually does with this group, and I'm really excited about it. Um, so the next thing I want to ask you to do is to think about narrative arc. And would you like to see another... Would you like to see another example with a like slightly different type of narrative arc, or would you like to think first and watch an example later? I saw some nods, for example. I'm going to show you one. Yeah? OK. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm going to show you one, um, one more video clip, then, uh, from a different fault line show. And this, the first clip that we showed was a pretty chron simple. I thought Mike was a, oh, kind on. of a jerk Stop playing. when we first met. I'm great with technology. It's really my strong suit. Um, so the first one was a, here's my story in chronological art, order. Here's the first thing that happened. It's the beginning. Here's the second, the mi next thing that happened. It's the middle. Here's the last thing that happened. It's the end. This one is a little bit different. It's a frame story. It's framed as um, a eulogy. So it's, it's a little bit of words about um, an experience of one person and then a story that that person told nested within it, and then what the listener took away from that story. So it's just a, a slightly different, but you'll see it still has a beginning, middle content, and, um, and a clear end. And this is from the play about um, EMTs and paramedics and ways of carrying uh, vicarious trauma. And it's a story that was actually told to us the the eulogy part is fictional the character that um, the character that she is describing is fictional but the story that he tells is um, is real and was told to our ensemble actually to me by an ER nurse who we worked with I thought Mike was a kind of a jerk when we first met but uh, he changed that eventually. And getting to work with him made this job so much better. He always seemed stronger than me. He'd been in this longer and he taught me so much. I'm not sure how we keep going on without him around. There was this one time I asked him how he'd been in this so much longer than me and still seemed okay. When I feel like I'm dragging around these huge weights sometimes and each patient's story feels like this giant boulder and some days I can barely move. And he said, I carried pebbles. If each patient's Weight is a boulder. You can only carry a few before you're buried. But if you can just take a pebble from each patient, that's not that much weight, right? He said, I just try and take one pebble from each patient, just a little bit of that patient's story that I'm taking with me. Maybe it'll add up and be too heavy after a while. But I could carry a lot of pebbles before I get big. And I guess that's enough for now. I've been thinking about that since this. And I guess even pebbles still add up. But just talking about it with him, it felt like he took some of the weight and shared it with me. I got lighter. I'm gonna remember that.
So a little bit of a different beginning, middle, end structure in terms of, terms of chronology, but, um, but still kind of a three-part structure that, um, of moving from a painful place to a reminiscence to a place of a little bit of hope at the end. So I'm going to ask you now to think about the story or the beginning of a story that you thought of um, and map out for yourself before we share it in its entirety with each other and map out for yourself what's the beginning, the middle, and the end of this story. Um, where does it start? How do we get where we're going? And where does it conclude? And think as you're doing that about who you might be telling it to, whether today that might be someone in this room um, that maybe you're creating it for. It's also fine to create it for a different audience. But as you think about that beginning, middle, end, what do you want them to take away um, by the time they get to the end? Where, where do you want them to be? So take just a minute. I promise you will get to share with each other. But take a minute and map it out for yourself first. Um, of where you want it to start, about what you want the middle content to be, and where you want it to end up. I think I see most, most people wrapping up. Anybody, anybody not ready to move forward? OK, great. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so quickly before we share, take a minute, scan through your story, ask yourself, is there, are there any details that need to be changed in order prote to protect someone's identity? Are there any parts of this that someone hasn't given consent to have shared that I should change a detail, change a name, change a location um, so that I'm not telling a story without someone's consent? And once you've done that for yourself, um, find a buddy for real this time. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes Pick one person, tell your story, give a, just a first messy, like, here it is. Um, make sure you're going through your beginning, middle, and end. Tell it to your partner, and your partner's job is to listen and then to respond with the answers to two questions. One is what stood out most in what you said, and the second is what did you want to hear more about? So speakers, go through. First stab at, at telling this does not have to be perfect at all. Um, and listeners, what stood out the most? What did you want to hear more about? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, then I'll have you switch. But I'll let you know when it's time to switch. So, uh, so those, are, those are the only two tasks right now. So pick, pick a person next to you. You'll get the chance to talk to someone else also. All right, as you're ready, I'm going to ask for your attention again. Um, how many people learned something from a story that you heard that you didn't know before? It can be something very small or something bigger. Anyone? Yeah, OK. A couple, couple things, a couple more over here. Great. Um, did anyone have trouble ending a story? This is what happens to me is I start telling a story, and then I'm like, where? I know where I want to end, but like, what do I say to end it? Um, so thinking, like, what is the sentence that I am going to say when I get to the end really helps me before telling a story in, in a more public sense. Like, how, what, is, what are the words that I'm going to use to conclude this and know that I'm done and feel like I've concluded the way that I want to rather than just trailing off, um, which is something I tend to do. Um, who, like, anyone catch one? Anyone, anyone like, I feel, I feel good about this. I feel excited to share this with a slightly larger group. I'm going to preface this by saying it can be messy. I think everyone in this room knows that like messy and imperfect stories are often far more impactful than like perfectly polished ones. Yeah. Yeah, would you like to come up? I would love to give you a microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you can stand, you can sit, up to you. And tell us your name first. Sure. My name is Maya. Um, and I currently live in Montpelier, and I was living in Montpelier in the 2023 floods. Um, and my story begins in Brattleboro. I was there for a week and a half rehearsal process um, for a show that was going to be touring around Vermont to different Vermont towns with the Vermont Suitcase Company. And the shows that Vermont Suitcase Company puts on are all Commedia dell'arte, they're all comedy, they're wacky, they're uh, absurd, 
a little curt sometimes. And it was like midway through our rehearsal process when the rains came. We were all looking at our phones. We were rehearsing in this big, um, like this rehearsal space that had big, beautiful windows. And we could look out on Mount Wantasticate and the Connecticut River. And it was just gray and raining. And so when we weren't busy, like actively rehearsing, we were staring out the window or staring at our phones and worried about what was happening. Um, the next day, Brattleboro was completely fine, um, having not had the threat of the dam breaking in Brattleboro, um, although that was, that was a potential, it didn't happen. Um, but then r reaching out and talking to my roommates who um, knew the situation more so in Montpelier, um, I lived on Langdon Street at that time, luckily on a second floor, so all of my things were okay, but we could no longer go back there, basically. Um, and so the middle of my story is that the producers of the Vermont Suitcase Company were in a lot of conversations with the um, venues that we were going to br bring these shows to, and sort of being like, is this going to be more labor for you? Is this going to be a burden for you? Should we cancel this show? All of that sort of stuff. Um, some venues were like, we simply don't have a place anymore uh, to host this. So yes, we will have to cancel it. Um, for example, Charlie O's uh, could not host us. We had that show lined up. Um, but in a case like that, we had some local organizers who like would move, help us move to a different venue, and we performed at the old shelter um, at Hubbard Park. And all of the funding for that went to the employees of Charlie O's because they weren't going to have any money for the time that they were um, uh, out of work. So, um, and then another response that we got through. Uh, the producers talking to our venues was um, please come like we need opportunity for leisure rather than labor um, because we're going to be you know working so hard on mucking out these places we want to laugh um, and so we ended up doing a good chunk of the tour um, and I think for me the end of my story is that um, it was a learning moment. I think I tend to have a orientation towards when things are serious, it's time to be serious. Um, and so it was completely against my nature to show up to a place that was experiencing tragedy and put on a comedy. Um, but again and again, it, it was clear that like once I got in front of the audience and could feel the reciprocity of like them leaning in and like grateful for something to escape, with, um, it, was, it was clear to me that there's a potentially more value in being silly and wacky on stage than I potentially thought in the past. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. And I, we're running a little bit short on time, so rather than saying more, I want to ask if anyone else wants to wants to tell one. We've got a few more minutes. I can go next if no one wants to, but if anyone wants to, I'd way rather uh, give away this microphone. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll do one since I keep putting people on the spot. Um, my story comes from the July floods from this year. My swift water rescue team got deployed. I live in southern Vermont, but we got deployed up to central, um, central Vermont, not, not too far from this area. And we spent most of a night, the night of July 10th, uh, driving around trying to get places where our dispatch was sending us and not being able to because we had three boat trailers and the roads were washed out. And finally, around a little after midnight, we got to a house that had five people in it, a family of five, and had become an island because the river that ran on one side of their house suddenly was running on both sides of their house. And my partner and I were sent to wade across the river through like thigh-high moving water to get to the house. And it was a little 
it was a little dicey. That was the hard part of the rescue for me, especially as a person who's not that big. Um, and we got to the house and we're like, okay, that was the hard part. Can like breathe a sigh of relief. We're okay. We know what to do from here. And we threw a line across the river and we rigged up an inflatable boat that the firefighters on the other side where we'd left them could haul, haul us back in. And we checked in with the, the parents of this family who were on the porch and explained to them that we're going to put them two at a time with me into the boat and um, haul them across the water so they don't have to wade through the, the deep water that we did. And one of the parents looks at us and says, oh, my son's going to have a heart attack about this. And we say, how old are your kids? And she says, I have two teenagers and an eight-year-old. And the eight-year-old comes out of the house a minute later, and my partner, Chris, gets like down on his knees and is checking in with this kid. And this kid is like clearly nervous, but also has lots of questions about what we're doing and how it's going to work. And Chris is explaining every single part of like, this is how the boat works, and this is how the line works, and this is how your life jacket works, and can we put it on? And here's what each strap does and each bucket does, uh, buckle does. And this kid's like getting more and more relaxed and more and more interested. This works, and we're like, okay, this is, this is okay. Like, this is gonna work. We're getting to a place, and we explain to him that like he and his mom are gonna go first, so he'll have a reassuring presence with him. And we're just about to walk them down um, to where the boat is when the two teenagers come out of the house, and Chris is still talking with the younger kid, and I turn to them and introduce myself and. Um, explain a little bit about what we're doing and what they can expect and ask how they're holding up and the taller one just turns pale and turns to me and says, well, I'm scared of moving water. And that was the moment when I realized that she wasn't talking about the eight-year-old, she was talking about the 17-year-old. Um, and we, we thought that we were totally on firm ground um, and this, this older, older teenager had this very specific fear that um, this situation that he was in was perfectly set up to trigger. And he ended up doing great. We, like, we talked through the process. He and his sibling went across together with me. He was like very stable and calm and safe in the boat and was incredibly brave. And we got everyone across the water. Um, and and he was, he was just incredibly solid and brave through the whole thing. But I, I learned this lesson in that moment about the assumptions that we make about other people's experience um, and the fact that each of these five people in this house, what was the easy part of the rescue to me was not the easy part of the rescue necessarily to them. I was like, we've gotten through the hard part and now all we have to do is have people sit in the boat and not move too much so we don't flip it over um, and this this teenager was like, I have to face one of my biggest fears that has just perfectly come to my home in the middle of the night. Um, and we didn't ask the question of that parent, which kid and what's the, like, how can we support them? We just made an assumption about, um, about who she was talking about. So my partner and I have told that story to several people on our team um, since then. And I learned a lot from that teenager being that brave in that moment. Thanks so much. All right. I think we've got time for one more if anyone has one. Okay, if not, what, any reflections on what this experience was like? I've only done this particular format. Did you have something to say? I've only, <laughs> great. <laughs> I've only done this particular format of this workshop once before, and it was at the emergency management conference last week, um, which was a very different context. So I'm curious, I'd love to hear like reflections on what that was or uh, what that was like for you or questions about this process as we kind of move forward as an ensemble and figure out um, where, we might, where we might or might not take this kind of like short storytelling format. Um, I thought this was really interesting and part of the reason I signed up for or I came to this session was because the work that I do um, at my organization is to try to get people to do like sort of the paradigm shifting work of like these big interconnecting systemic crises that we're facing 
And I've been thinking that part of what would make that more effective is the ethnographic aspect of that because I feel like people really connect to them and there's specific stories that are like from real people's lived experiences. Um, so I guess my question is like, well, for one, I think this has been really helpful in trying to figure out how to like tease those out, but how have you found collecting the story? Like, for example, the, the stories that some of those plays were based on, maybe for people that are less likely to want to talk about those things, like EMT people or climate scientists. Like, how do you first collect the stories and then translate them into something that feels accessible to people? That's a really good question, and I want to hear more about the work that you do. I think um, we've had an experience of people self-selecting and really letting people self-select, um, and we also, as an ensemble, have not, we haven't created stories that were completely separate from our lived experiences as an ensemble. Um, or we've, we've created performances on themes that only impact some of us, or only some of us have a personal relationship to, but we've never, um, we've never worked on one that none of us had a personal lived experience of. Um, and I think that's, that's been important in having at least a bit of shared common ground. Um, I have a lot of questions about like whether it would ever be appropriate for us to do something that none of us had uh, lived experience in. Um, and then the first, the first question that I always ask anyone who is interested, who is, I'm in conversations with about a project is what made you interested in this project? Why did you respond to that email or that phone call or that flyer? And usually that's an hour of conversation and then I'm like, wow, I have a lot of transcribing to do, thank you so much. Um, and, and if not, like, then a few more open-ended questions, but just letting people, if people are offering to share a story with, with me, I've found that they know what the story is and they know what they want to share and what they don't want to share. And, the more I can let the conversation be directed by them, the more um, willing to have the conversation they are and like the, the safer that they feel um, and more confident that they're not gonna be like asked to share something that they're not consenting to share. I don't know if that helps, but that's my like little little bit of thoughts and um, yeah, I have similar questions. I really appreciated the framing questions, the whole idea of what stood out the most and what do you want to hear more about? Um, I just, I don't think about myself as like shaping narratives and tell, I, I, if you know me, you know I just ramble on and tell a story. <laughs> anyway, so I just felt, I, I appreciated that, those framing questions and thinking about the beginning, middle, and end as I think about narratives. Thank you, that's really good. <laughs> part of my question is like, is this framing what parts of this framing are helpful and what parts should we move away from? Other reactions or questions? Well, I love stories, um, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about the impact of telling stories um, and uh, the value um, for this particular um, time that we're living in of telling these stories and um, not so much that it then becomes uh, like um, we're doing a, a drive-by of a car accident and we're just looking at the car accident and it's fascinating and we're just getting off on the, <laughs> the accident aspect of it, right? Because that's what climate crisis feels like right now to a lot of people. And I'm interested in collective action. And so what I'd like to know a little bit more about um, maybe some uh, the impact and the value in, in telling the stories and what it could bring. I imagine probably most most people in this room, probably including you, could answer that question from an angle and like together, along with a lot of other people's angles, they would add up to a whole picture. Um, the thing thing that comes to mind, I'm, I come from a public health background and works, worked in arts and public health for a bit, so I'm going to give you the like data nerd answer very briefly, um, which is uh, there was a study done, um, a group called 
oh no, I'm going to forget their name, Hollywood Health and Society, I think, um, which was started by one of the first, the first physician to write for a TV show, um, wrote for ER, I think. Um, and they did an experiment where they dropped information about the HPV vaccine when it first came out into, a, I think it was a Law and Order episode. Um, and beforehand, they partnered with Gallup, I believe, to poll um, the general public in the US on knowledge about the HPV vaccine. And then afterwards, they did a second poll and they also asked people, did you see this episode of Law and Order? Or like, did you watch, do you watch Law and Order? And among people who watched Law and Order and also people who didn't watch Law and Order, the knowledge like increased dramatically from just a short time before this episode aired and a short time after. Um, and that's like one, that's one very small answer to your question, but I think that it says something, um, something evidence-based about the way that stories and narratives can like find their way into society and you can hear a little bit of a story that has a kernel of information in it and it sometimes sits more strongly than like that ad in the magazine or the ad on TV or that thing that a healthcare provider said at some point um, in your life. And I think the, the sort of other, other side of that that I would say is something that happened with the play about EMTs and paramedics and mental health, um, mental health experiences was we came into this like series of interviews asking what made you interested in this project? What do you think is important for people to know? Um, and what story do you think we should be telling? And we ended up doing a workshop production of it at a theater called Coho in Oregon um, when some of us were out there. And we put it, we put on this workshop with like 20 minutes of material. And at the end, the artistic director was like, there were no patients or like accidents and no gore in that. And we were like, yeah, you're right. Like we didn't, people didn't tell us like put gore and injured people on stage. And so we didn't. And it, it turned into, because we were asking people, what do, you, what do you think should be shared? It turned into something that was much more about like little moments and conversations in bars with coworkers after a hard call or um, descriptions of the, um, the like, mental health toll of the work or moments of strong relationships between coworkers. And we ended up writing an entire play that didn't have, it had one emergency scene on it. Um, but only because there was a, a paramedic who was involved in a medical emergency and that was, that was a story that was important to tell. Um, and the rest of it was like much more, much smaller, more mundane moments. And I think, in, I think that was that group of people who we talked to kind of leading us away from the like voyeuristic, looking at the hard dramatic things for whatever part of our like brains or hearts that 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 like want to see that and leading us towards the like um the story that the experts in the field were saying needed to be told i don't know if that answers your question at all because i don't have the answer to your question but those are a couple of reflections and i think everyone in the room can probably answer that better and i also think we're out of time so <laughs> um i hope to talk to all of you more about this um at the at the reception in just a few minutes and thank you so much for being on this experiment with me i appreciate it